start with how you first started playing, you said, when you were 11? Oh, well, I started playing uh, when I was 11 years old. Uh, I come from a long line of uh, jazz musicians in my family. My name is Charles Gabriel. And uh, I started playing with the Rico Jazz Band here in New Orleans in 1943 because my father uh, always uh, started teaching me when I was about seven years old. And when I got to be 11 years old, me and my cousin Clarence Ford, we was pretty uh, officially on the clarinet. We can read real good. So the war was going on. And so when they called my dad, man, we have a job for you. He would tell them, say, no, 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 I can't, I can't take it, but you can take the kid. That would mean, because a lot of the musicians at that time was in the service, mm. and they needed musicians. But because I can read good, they let me play with, with the Eureka Jazz Band. And the leader of the band at that time was T-Bar Rene. He had a lot of old guys in that band. And they had T-Bar Renee, they had Red Clark on, 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 on Susan Phone, they had Albert Warner on Alto, Willa Humphrey, it was in that band, and, and Percy Humphrey, Kid Sheet, Kid Clayton, uh, Jim Robinson, and uh, Kid, uh, Kid Howard later on. Kid Howard, all these musicians was well, my overseer, so many time someone called my dad for a job and he couldn't do it, he sent me on, on, on the job to play with these different musicians. So they helped to raise me, musically speaking, mm -hmm. see. I was fortunate enough to play with, with, with Jim Robinson and his, his uncle named Jim Little coming from a funeral. And I remember Jim Little and Jim Robinson, after he left the funeral, they were walking down the street playing a beautiful hymn that the tuba and the trombone player, and that really impressed me and really stayed with me a long time in my life. I always remember them. Like I remember uh, seeing the Dad Vean Band in here in New Orleans early in life, where they had Mr. Louis Contrell, a clarinetist, and uh, one of the clarinetists. And I took, my dad took me to all the rehearsals and things, so I was familiar with these different musicians. And he played Stardust. That stayed with me all my life, with the little contrail. So I was very fortunate and very blessed to have that type of uh, environment to be raised up in, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, kid, I played with Kid Howard, Kid Sheep. I played with Abba William. I played with... Uh, Crate Met T Bar Renee, uh, 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 Andrew Jefferson, Toma Jefferson. I did all that early in life, you know. Mm -hmm. And uh, it helped in, to shave my way up musically in, in my professional life, too, by knowing all these old songs coming out of New Orleans, knowing these old songs. My family, well, all of them played music. Uh, my great grandfather, Nassiz Gabriel, came in from Singer Dominguez in 1841. And my grandfather, uh, Martin Joseph Gabriel, uh, was born here in New Orleans. And my father was born here in New Orleans, too. And so, what they had put a, a book out on some of this information that I would like to show you, if, if you. And that book is by your nephew, or uh, it's, just it's book, by a relative? Uh, this is my uncle, mm -hmm. uncle Clyde, my daddy's brother, one of his youngest brothers. That's his youngest brother. And the book is, is about, about his, his dad. My dad played old kind music by Lawrence mm -hmm. Gabriel, Larry Gabriel. But in the book, you, you see all the, the generation uh, of my family, which goes in as follows. If you can uh, if you can see if Nazis Gabriel is is my great grandfather and that's the first generation. The second generation is my grandfather, Martin Joseph Gabriel. And all this this Martin Joseph Gabriel, this this is the second generation. Albert Dude Gabriel, that's a cousin and Joseph Gabriel is another cousin. In the third generation, uh, uh, Alvin Kohler, uh, Clarence Gabriel, and uh, my dad and Martin Gabriel, 
And over here, his younger brother, which is Percy Gabriel, on the front of the book. My aunt Cecile, that's all, oh, that's the third generation. August Lenoir, Osley, Dave Osley, all that. And now come the fourth generation. And uh, Dave Oxley's son, Dave Frank. Dave Oxley is a uh, Frank Oxley's father, is uh, the American to the family, uh, which is my aunt Esther, brother in law, which is married to my, my, uncle, my uncle Percy. And both Dave and Frank played with, with Preservation Hall. Uh, Frank Oxley played at the Preservation Hall, but Dave Oxley was with, with Bessie Smith. She had an accident, he was the driver. And Bessie oh, yeah. Smith wasn't able to be stepped into the hospital. And the yeah, first in thing, and she died from, uh, from bleeding because it wasn't a scepter. Then that is third gen. Now come the fourth generation. Yeah, my cousin Clarence Ford. Clarence Ford, my brother August Gabriel, my, my, my sister in law, who is married to my brother Bessie Gabriel. And this, I'm in the fourth generation, there's me. And my, my brother Elliot Gabriel, and then got my brother Joe Gabriel. Elliot played piano, Joe played bass, and Larry, he played bass and, and, and guitar. That's the, that's the uh, folk generation. And uh, as we go into this particular book, I know you can't see it, but uh, my brother Leonard, Leonard Gabriel, he was a trumpet player and trombone player. My brother Martin, he's a trumpet player. And Osley, Frank Osley played drum. My, my, uh, my sister Florin was a piano player and saxophone player before me. She was born way before me. And then the fifth generation is my niece Marjorie Gabriel, that's my brother Joe Gabriel, daughter. She, she's a, a music director. She got the gospel choir in Detroit, uh, the Metropolitan Choir. Then we got Louis Gabriel, which is Clarence Ford's brother. And then we got uh, Status Ford, which is Clarence Ford's grandson. All mm -hmm. oh, this is in the fifth generation. Then we have Damon Gabriel, that's my brother August's son. You know, he played trumpet. And then we have Gabriel Holtman, which is my cousin uh, Phyllis, son. He played trumpet. Then we have the sixth generation, Status trumpet, which is the son of uh, Status, Clarence Ford, grandson. So that's sixth generation of us playing that's music That's a lot today. of people playing music in one family. Yeah. So, Do you have kids? I have one daughter. I have one daughter, uh, two grands, a grandson and a, and, a, and a granddaughter. And I got two great grands. Oh. See, that's what I have, but I have a small family. <laughs> but I, I come from a large family, you know. So I uh, spent a lot of time uh, in Detroit, Michigan, too. Mm -hmm. uh, I went to Detroit, Michigan back mm -hmm. in 1948. I'm about 15 years old. Yeah, now how did you wind up? You went there to work. I mean, oh. how did. You went there to play music. I mean, how, well, no, how did you get not out of originally. School? Originally, we, I didn't go directly to go play music. My older brother and sister, they would both have been going out to California to take my mother in for a better lifestyle. Cause it was segregated down here, and they wanted to get her out into another area to have a better lifestyle. But by them being young, they were 22, 23 years old. They went the long way to go to California, went to Chicago, and like young people would do. And they broke down in Detroit. The car broke down. Well, uh, the war was going on at that time. That's like in 41, 42, and 43 at that time. I'm still in New Orleans. So when, the, when, the, uh, when they broke down in Detroit, they were making them big tanks and things. So it was a lot of work. So they got to work in Detroit and they put down on the house and asked my mother to come up to Detroit. That's how I migrated mm -hmm. to Detroit. Some of, them, some of my family started moving to Detroit in 41 and 42, my earlier, but I didn't get to Detroit until 1948. So I've been playing a long time, so I was forced enough to get to Detroit and play along with Lion Hampton Big Band. And you were only 
15, I'm, I'm about 16. 16 years old with Lionel Hampton Band. So were you and, still going to school and playing music uh, I guess at night? I, uh, I wasn't going to school. I just hadn't gotten out. I just have got out of school. And uh, with Lionel Hampton Band, and in Lionel Hampton Band, they, they had uh, Fat Nouvelle, what it was called, Fat Girl, a wonderful jazz trumpeter, and they had Red Fox on drum, they had uh, who else that, that I can remember in that in, in Lionel Han, Lion Hampton band? Charlie Mingus. Yeah. Charlie Mingus was in the band playing. Uh, he was the bass player, and uh, Milk Butner was the piano player in the band at that time. He the one that started the block chord thing, you know. So I was supposed to another type of uh, uh, musician of another level, a different style of music after I left New Orleans. So being in Detroit, I, was, I got uh, thought to uh, playing a different style of music. I thought playing a little more modern music. And I was coming around with guys like Lou Claire Rockamo, who was a wonderful trumpet player that Miles David uh, always acknowledged. Lou Claire Rockamo is in his book. And also uh, uh, Donald Bird, Barry Harris, uh, uh, Doug Watson and all these great musicians, they all left later on from Detroit and went to New York. They became New York musicians of Tomba Flanagan, Music Light T, and, and Barry uh, Kenny Burrell, all those musicians I was in the mingle with at that time when I was in Detroit. So I was fortunate enough to, uh, uh, to, to have another different insight on music. And while I was in Detroit, I, I wind up playing with, into Rita Franklin band. I remember Rita Franklin band for for a period of time, and and that might have been like in '69, I think. How did you I, get that gig? What? How did you get that gig with Aretha Franklin? In Rita Franklin band. Well, by being in the, uh, uh, all the musicians, we all in Detroit. We had jam session. Everybody knew who you are. Down the town with the band leader. And uh, they would have a rehearsal. So uh, Lou John was in the band, Chip Alcott, Donald Town, uh, uh, Miller Bristol, uh, so on and so on. So we all knew one another. So Donald Town asked me would I be interested in, in, being, in uh, being in the band. Well, uh, I went into the band with, with Rita Frank Band on alto saxophone. And uh, the, the baritone player that had decided, his name would call him Johnny Green Jank, had decided he didn't want to go back on the road. He was playing baritone. So they took me and they threw me on the baritone. So I had to, they, when, we got to when we got to France, they threw me on the baritone. I started playing baritone in the band with Rita Franklin. But I had a big awakening when I got to France because I was doing a, doing a rehearsal. Uh, Chip Alcott, the trombonist, wrote a Raymond on my way. And I was playing the baritone, my solo and everything on that. And when I got finished, uh, I got off the, off the stage, the guy walked up to me and he said to me, he said, you from New Orleans? I said back to him, I said, no, 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 I'm from Detroit. I said, because I would read a Franklin, it's 1969. I've been in Detroit since 1948. So I said, no, 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 I'm, 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 I'm from Detroit. I said, no, 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 you're from New Orleans because it's in your playing, it's in your music. He said, what your name is? So I, I told him my name was Charles Gabriel. He said, well, do you know Mary Gabriel? I said, no, you know Ma uh, Maple Gabriel? So no, no, you called a lot of different guys, name, people named, but I didn't know who they were. So, but anyway, he, he liked me and he took me around France and showed me Cinebiche statue and everything else. So when I came back to, to the state, I told my dad, I said, Dad, you got to know all the way over in France. And I told him what had happened. He shook his head and said, no, no. He said, he don't know me, he know my pa. I said, he, know, he, said, he know my, my grandfather. I said, what? So, so right then, he scared the hell out of me, really. <laughs> They wow. go somewhere and someone just call all these people names mm -hmm. related to you and you didn't know none of them. Those are my daddy, my aunts, you know what I mean? 
So I took a tape recorder down and started interviewing everybody in my family. So I had all that on, on tape, even though I lost some of it after it had a flood in my basement, lost some of that uh, thing. So I had my dad, my uncle, and all, each one of them telling me who they were. And my dad said, yeah. I'm Martin Gabriel. Uh, he was, he said, I remember my dad and we were rehearsing the band in the front room that was here in New Orleans. I told my grandfather had the National Jazz Band here in New Orleans. That's how I getting to know who I was and where I come from and who my people were who have been in this music industry all their lives. So, Did you ever go to Santo Domingo and see where your family was from? My, I, I didn't know where they were from yeah. until after I thought interviewing my, I heard, always heard my aunt say, say, Papa speaks Spanish. My dad spoke a little Spanish too, but my mother spoke French. So I didn't understand what was going on, and, and but they can communicate, but they wouldn't teach us because they didn't want us to know what they were talking about. <laughs> so they run us out of them and say, you too smart, you right behind you, get out of here, you know? So I never learned how to speak. I know two, three words, Spanish, two, three words of French. But my mother and my father, they can communicate. She spoke Spanish, she spoke French, but they, they communicate because some of the Creole words run into French. French and some Spanish were mixed up, it's all messed up. So <laughs> that's how I, uh, I got into Rita Franklin Band because the guys uh, knew I was and that we all were friends. So I stayed with Rita Franklin for about a couple of years, I imagine. Then after I left with Rita Franklin Band, I was fortunate enough to go with this guy, uh, J.C. Hurd. J.C. Hurd was the drummer mm -hmm. with, with uh, uh, Cab Calloway. Wow. Cab Calloway, J.C. Hurd was the drummer with Cab Calloway. He was in that band along with Dizzy Gillespie and Danny Barker, who was one of our historians from out of New Orleans. So being with J.C. Hurd, I stayed with J.C. Hurd nine years. I recorded and some. You wrote some, some songs? For I, wrote, that band? I wrote on this album here. I, let me see my glasses. I wrote up. Uh, I love, this is a beautiful song, I can't play it, but uh, I, wrote, I wrote the I love, and I wrote Miranda. Miranda was uh, for my grandbabies. She was born, and uh, I asked my daughter what her, what her name was, she said, I think Miranda. So I wrote, it, I wrote that for her. I wrote another song on here called I'm Free. And uh, the, I did give you a piece of, of the I love. If, yeah, if we can play the a little I love. I can't play it good, but uh, I can set the end my world and dream of how it could be. All the love inside of me That's what it sometimes do so That's what I love And the Miranda was, it was, a little, uh, was like a, a walk Sleep Miranda sleep Free. It says, I'm free, not living in a pair, clinging to a love, going on welfare, no broken dream, or sleepless night, I'm free. Your love's 
See, that's another one. Like, but yeah. another piano player playing, not me, <laughs> playing saxophone on it. So that was a very good experience for me to be with J.C. Hurd for a long time. I stayed with him, uh, I think, uh, nine years. This is one of the, that, that's, that's a picture of J.C. Hurd there, where we are in here. Over here, a picture of him with William. Over there too, that's J.C. Hurd. Wonderful musician. He, he made a transition not so long ago. See? And uh, after I left J.C. Hurd, uh, one of my closest friends was Marcus Belgrade. Marcus Belgrade was, was a trumpeter that was with Ray, with Ray Charles' mm -hmm. band for many years. He from ben, uh, Barbados. But raised up in uh, Pennsylvania, and uh, he came to Detroit in, in '67, and we stayed together, stayed at my home with me for about six years, and we traveled together. We did a lot of, a lot of nice things together, me and Marcus Belgray. Let me see if I can find him in this. I got him in here. It will be, and. Uh, Anyway, we recorded a lot of songs to get here yet. This is, this is Marcus Belgray. And these are my brothers, Marcus and my brother Joe, my brother Elliot, myself, my brother Leonard, and, and, and also Larry Gabriel. See? Who wrote the book? That's Larry. It. Larry, who wrote the book, that's right. So uh, uh, we did a lot, of, a lot of things together. Here's a something when I was uh, doing Calypso, I had a Calypso wow. band for seven years, and when the Halle Bella Fonte came up with, Deo, Deo, daylight come and I wanna go home. Deo, Deo, daylight come and I wanna go home. So when we were doing Calypso music, you know. It was very I'm, popular. I'm tonight and tell me what to give my dad till last night be from me. <laughs> All that sort of thing. Mom, look at boo boo. <laughs> you were so, wearing those like island costumes? Oh, oh yeah. Well, yeah. Yeah, this some of the that's I was a costume. We did a uh, clip go underneath the what do you call it? The limbo stick? The limbo thing. Yeah, I did a I was working at a a club in Detroit called the Brass Rail. And uh, I had the band upstairs, but they had a group coming in into the club called uh, from the Bahamas, and he wanted the the black group to to back them up. Understand? So he came to me and he said, "Charlie, you play calypso music?" I said, "No, I don't play no calypso music." He said to me, "Well, I got a group coming in here from the Bahamas, and uh, I want you to play that music." I said, well, I don't know them. He said, well, you want this job? <laughs> <laughs> so I so you figured it out. Music real quick. So this is a, a pictures of me and my cousin, Clarence Ford, here in New Orleans when we were about, I'm about 10, 9, 10 years old, and, uh, practicing the clarinet. So that goes way back. Now, Clowns Four was the uh, was Fat Domino band, my first mm -hmm. cousin, Clowns We stayed with him a long time in, in, uh, until, he, uh, 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 until he had an accident and didn't want to go back on the road. That Dave Osley, I'm mm -hmm. say that my uncle first see me if I can find uh, Clowns Four. Uh, huh, 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 huh. This, now, this is my cousin, Clowns Four. He was Dave Osley for many, uh, uh, and Tom Bass in the uh, Fat Domino band for a long time. And uh, him and her, Horse Estate. See, he was a wonderful musician. He all the reason flew, all a wonderful person. Here's a picture of me, and I was directing for Joe Simon. I had Joe Simon band yeah. for about uh, ooh, three to four years, I imagine. I directed for Joe Simon. He had nine pieces, but uh, I had to let that go. Can I and, you uh, show me that picture of you when you were when you were little with your cousin? We can I ask you some more about New Orleans when you were a kid? A picture when I was little. The one that you just showed. Uh, uh, that one that me and Ford. Clint, yeah. Yeah, that, yeah, that is when, a funny picture. <laughs> <laughs> when you were, I mean, when when you were growing up. That's on Conti and Joe was right. 
In, that's in Tremere area, right in the Tremere. Oh, and that's Tremere before they built the overpass. Oh yeah, all so that was before that. The neighborhood must have been a lot different. It was, it was a different neighborhood uh, at that time. Now this is the one. Mm, that had a picture. <laughs> Yes. Did you guys go out and, and practice well, in the street a lot? Uh, what we usually do at, during this period of time, now here in New Orleans, it was common to see a lot of uh, two or three guys walking down the street singing duets. It'd be nothing less common, like I told you about Mr. Uh, Jim Robinson and Jim Little. They go down the street and they'll be singing song and they play, you know. So uh, New Orleans was different during that time. It, it's New Orleans, not that it ain't good now, it's great. I love New Orleans, all the way to love New Orleans. But, the, and this was during segregation time too. Mm -hmm. But the, uh, the, the, the feeling of New Orleans at that time, they had more of a uh, community taking care of the children. Anyone in the block could, could tell you, you're doing something wrong, call your house, and if you did something wrong, your mama gave you a whip and they'd be hip, give you a lick aside your head, that was okay too. Go home and tell your mama to get another lick aside your head. So, it was a different atmosphere. Did your that mom play no music? What? Actually, did, you, did your mother play music? My mother was a saxophone player. Let me see, I got her in this book. Hmm. Let me see if I get my mother. So is that why you picked up the saxophone? No. I want to play clarinet. I mean, I want to play trumpet. And my father told me, you are too many trumpet players in, in the family. So you can't play no trumpet. This, my, that's my dad, and I'm gonna find my mother. This, my father and all his sons. That's that there. My father, and there I am. My brother, Ark, my brother, Leonard, my brother, Ark Martin on the piano. Yeah, there was something there. I'm gonna see if I can find my mother. Did um, she play in a band? No, no, no. She played, but she stopped playing. See, on my family, on both sides of my family, they were new. My, on my mother's side, uh, uh, Al Gang and, 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 and Charlie Gang, they had the they had the Salad Green Show. Mm -hmm. You ever heard of the Salad Green? The no. Salad Green Show was the largest show that came out of New Orleans, and, and it folded up in 1931. Bill Robinson, you heard of Bill Robinson? Yeah. He was the tap at Esther Waters. Yeah. Okay. They was a member of the Salad Green Show. I could so have this is that. like a vaudeville show. That, 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 that. Yeah. They had Curse Line girl dancing, and all my cousins, they all moved to New York. They all, that's on my mother's side now. So I had to jump for you. Uh, my mother, them people moved to, to New York in 1921. My mother stayed here in New Orleans to raise her family with my father. So, uh, they would be going back from New Orleans to New York, New Orleans to New York, because the Sally Green Show would have, was one of the largest shows we had. And it worked at the Lyric Theater that burnt down here in New Orleans. It burnt down in New Orleans, mm. the Lyric Theater. Uh, the Lyric Theater is where the Motown, uh, the ever heard uh, Motown, or what do you call it? Uh, uh, it's not Motown, it's, uh, uh, hmm. Uh, they had a big show, uh, music from that show. It'll come to me what, what, what it is. Like, I can't think of what that, that show was. But this is, anyway, this is my father, and that's T. Bar Renee. Okay, who you were talking T about? I told you about the Arika Jared Band. That T. Bar Renee and my father, they're working at a club here on Bourbon Street, we're called the Paddock. Now it's called Mahogany Hall. Okay. That with the Paddock. That's my dad there. That's my mother and my father there. Oh, you're both playing together. They're both playing together. See? But she stopped playing. See, well, she was a saxophone player. Isn't that something? <laughs> <laughs> uh, so what kind of music did you listen to around the house? Did you what kind of music did you listen to around the house? You know, around every Sunday here I go to back to New Orleans, but every Sunday my dad would have us to play hymns. We played a lot of hymns on every Sunday. Well, my father would play now no no, my dad would be playing drum. My cousin Clarence Ford play alto. I'll be playing tenor. My brother Augie playing trumpet. My brother Martin playing trumpet. 
and my uncle Clarence, uh, with my daddy's brother, played the piano. And my uncle August, which was my daddy, not, not his son. He was on the road. My uncle Percy was on the road with Jay Machan Band. So my oh. uncle August would play bass. See, and that, um, oh, that's August Lenoir. Uh, you saw him in front of the book, August Lenoir. It would be uh, where he's at. It'd be this guy right there, August Lenoir. He'd be playing bass. So we played a lot of hymns on Sunday. But during, during the week, we usually just jam. Uh, my, dad, my dad would uh, pick out the drum and play the drums. Uh, uh, Tomba Jefferson, who lived around the corner from our house on Miro and Quantai, and you come by the house, he was one of the piano players and also with a trumpet player. He worked down the block at this club for many years, the Maison Burden, Tomba Jefferson. And uh, that's where he worked on I think he made the transition. So we just did music was every day in my home. It was not a day passed by we didn't play music. So it was, it was just like everyday conversation, you know? You always play it, you know? And, and the more you play, the more my father and them liked it. Liked it, you know? Will you, um, would you mind demonstrating some of the traditional stuff that you first yeah, played yeah, well, with, with the Eureka? Uh, when I first got in the band with Willie Humphrey and them, with the Rico Jazz Band, I recall, I recall after we played the funeral, we would go, uh, leave the cemetery and we would walk about two blocks and they'll play just a little while to stay here, you know, something like that. That was just a little while to stay here mm -hmm. because it was, it was, but it boom, ba doom, ba doom, boom, 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 beep, doom, be it, be. You marching with them. So that was one of the songs I remember doing. The funerals the used to funeral. be much more formal then. Yeah, well, no, but see, we went for, for the funeral, they pay a durus for at for least the body.
Then drum, blap, 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 blap. Then we, then we jam, mm -hmm. you know. So, but that after release the body, we don't do that as long as we have the body in our present. Nothing up tempo is supposed to be played. Mm -hmm. You only play something up tempo after you release the body to give some joy to the loved one who had lost their loved one. See, to, lead, to ease in their burden. And then the people hear the music in the street. Then the people in the street join in and start what they call the second line. This is how the second line was created. Mm -hmm. It wasn't the people they didn't even know the deceased or anything like that. They're just people that heard the music and join and followed the band and that created the second line. All so right. it's a little different. I always thought everyone had jazz funeral, but I realized that was something that was special here in New Orleans. Cause it goes back to slavery time. When, the, when they was in slavery, they endured them licks on their back and they had what you call spiritual blueses. They sung to get through the hardship they were, they were living through. Mm -hmm. See, and, 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 and then the white master who was at that time had those slaves, he noticed that they worked in rhythm and, and they talked in rhythm. He allowed them to, to sing and dance. Before, they wouldn't let them sing or dance or anything until they put them on, on the auction block, which was that comedy, hall, comedy square. Mm -hmm. Then they let them sing and dance and they get a high, a high dollar for them because they said he had special gift. And that, but, but before that time, they wouldn't let them sing and dance. So when he found out they worked in rhythm and danced in rhythm, that it goes back into that period of time. And he only did that because he was singing spiritual blues. Mm -hmm. And then when he walked down the street, the, when the war was over with, in World War I, the war was over with, the bands were playing spiritual hymns in, in the street. And that was one of the songs. The, that's a hymn. Mm -hmm. So they're playing all the different hymns down in the valley. Mm -hmm. See? But later on, what really happened later on, they changed the words to the, to the spiritual blues and put ugly words to it on just a closer walk with the That's a hymn. Mm -hmm. But uh, as, 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 as they start getting into the street with the hymns and things, they changed the word and put uh, different words in, uh, to the mm -hmm. song. Like, Something you got to do. do oh, yeah. Make me work all, all day. day. But the big pie. something you got. Oh yeah. Da, dee, 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 da, da, dee, dee. That's something you got. Something you got. Boop, beep, beep, da. They make me work all day. So it was the same thing. So it's all connected. See? So uh, the musicians changed the, the concept of the music from the hymn into earthly music. See? Uh, I come, you do me like you do, do, do. That's a, that's a, a regular rule. Yeah. we baby. Then move, it years went by. People like uh, Sonny Rollins and uh, uh, they took the same song and, and it became modern and they did something to it like 
to do was that ASCAP and BMI was sitting there and you played them different songs that written by so and so they write it down and you had to pay taxes on it. The club haunt on it had to pay taxes on those songs, you know? So they tell the band leader that were playing in the club, y'all can't play those songs because we had to pay taxes on it. So what we did we played the chord changes of the old song and put different melodies on them. Huh. That's how bebop came in. Understand? Like when you, uh, uh, like we did in the app. <laughs> the Indiana. Mm-hmm. When Charlie Parker came, he did. That Donna D. See what I'm talking about? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so you played. Like what? <laughs> oh no, I was gonna say you played all these different styles yeah, in Detroit. Sure. You're playing modern and and too, but only because I was fortunate to be born in New Orleans and and, and, and come from the source. This is the source, New Orleans. Everything comes after that. We were lucky. Enough, we were lucky enough to nurse this music here in this city with them old musicians I was telling you about, Will Humphrey and Percy Humphrey and, and uh, Jim Roberts and all them guys, they played this stuff and they nursed this music. I didn't know they were making history. I was here among them nursing this too. But by being in that, when I went to Michigan, to Detroit, it was easy for me to play all this other stuff because I had one. Now I can go to two. I had a direction. so. That's what happened on that. Did that did the Detroit style influence you too? You know, well, did well, they you combine? Know, let me tell you about the Detroit. You know, you know, a lot of people don't realize your sound, the Motown sound. Mm-hmm. See, they built on New Orleans rhythm. Benny, ben, Benji Benjamin, who had the drum in Motown. I did some thing there, but I didn't have my name on none of the, none of the records. Cause we used to go down there and, and record and know who's gonna who's gonna be on the record. They put whoever they want to put on it. I didn't stick with it myself. Uh, the Motown sound is really boom, taken from from the clobber rhythm, just like the uh, uh, the bass drum here in New Orleans. Mm-hmm. See everything. I gotta take you guys back just a little bit. Gotta be too far away, too far. I gotta take you farther back to the ninth century. Okay. See, when the the ninth century, the Barbarians, which is African, conquered Spain. Mm-hmm. They ruled Spain for six hundred years. They had a natural American African rhythm and Spanish melody, and that created what they call habanero music. Habanero music is the the clava. That African rhythm and Spanish melody mm-hmm. that created all the rhythm that you hear, other than waltz, foxtrot, and marches, come from a tango, begin, samba, a bolero, uh, cha cha, African American music. Everything you hear come from African rhythm and Spanish melody. 
Now, when they got to, when they got to New Orleans back in the, they camped up bringing the slaves over here in the 17th century, 20,000 a year they brought over here. Mm -hmm. When they got to America, uh, we, especially here in, the, in, in, in New Orleans, uh, they took the, the cliverism and we knew it. Oh, when the same, go marching in. Oh, when the same, go marching in. Clavarism. Yeah. So we nursed it, and we created, we created other rhythm. We, we created sevenfold, we created six, eight, ninefold, all them different rhythm you hear now. In America, come from clobberism with the habanero music. Mm -hmm. Now, you, you follow me on? Oh, you? yeah. <laughs> okay, what else would you like me to tell you? <laughs> <laughs> will, will you um, tell me about Portland now? Now, in Portland, Oregon, uh, I was very. This is the early fun. 60s, right? I went to Portland on the early 60s, back 61 to be exact. How you know that? <laughs> I looked it up. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, uh, Portland, Oregon, I was working for a guy named Nate Zupman. Nate Zupman was a guy that uh, had a club where we had, we had dance. I had, I played from 9 to 4.30 in the morning, six nights a week for about six years. Playing this, what we call at that time, we called topless girl, topless knit, do this trip, take one piece up at a time. So I, I did a lot of that in, in Portland, Oregon. So I went into another bag. Cool, I played a lot of different styles of music. Mm -hmm. Portland was just one of the few places that I played. I was doing that at the Brass Rail in Detroit for, when they wanted me to play for the Calypso guys, you know. Uh, uh, but other than that, I like I like that in Portland six years, so uh, working for Nate Zupman. He was a wonderful, miss, wonderful person to work for, and I, I I'm very grateful that I had chance to uh, spend time up in Portland. So that's about it. You know. And you were the band leader there. I was the band leader in Portland. So how do you pick out songs for exotic dancers? Well, uh, no, see what happened when you're doing things like that. Some of the girls came into the club, like one girl. I don't remember, I can't remember her name, but she was, she had worked in Detroit at, at the Flame Show Bar with a wonderful uh, uh, ranger in Bandy, Maurice King. Maurice King wrote everything when she danced, she kicked her leg here, okay? well, everything on the paper was related to how she would dance. And she had to read, read whatever on the paper because she danced by those things. But the paper, the music was for a big band. I only had a trio. I had an organ, drum, and I'm playing sax. So I had to sit down and take the, the music and read the whole, everything, and condense it so she can dance on it. Hmm. That was some of them came. And then some of them come with no music, and you ask them what they want to dance on. Their name was some, a lot of them name uh, uh, Temptation. Da -de da, whatever it is. Da da, de -de -de -de. but I can't remember how temptation go now. But there was a lot of drums in it, so I didn't get there and then take the piece <laughs> off there. Piece off there. <laughs> so that was very interesting. So I learned a lot. I learned a lot from the sing dancers too. Yeah. Cause each one brought their personality to the bandstand, and you had. You have to blend, blend everyone's personality together so the music sounds good. It's all in the vibe. If we feel good collectively together, we'll sound good. But we we feel good and you don't feel good, it's, it's unbalanced, musically speaking, unbalanced, and it won't sound good. Mm -hmm. We all have to have the same direction and we all have to have the same concept and where we're going. And then we ought to follow the leader. Right. Yeah. So. <clears throat> Wow. And you traveled a lot, right? Even when you were based in Detroit, oh, yeah, I, you I, went to I France. I traveled and... with a lot of people. I played with, when I was young, I played with a little bebop band called Butter, Mc, Butter McLeod, Butter McCoy, and I did some things with a lot of guitar players, blue guitar player, John Lee Hooker. John Lee Hooker used to come over to my home. You know who John Lee Hooker is? Oh, yeah. yeah. And we used to rehearse in my basement. 
we did a, we, he, I did one thing with him, boy, well, I didn't write it, my brother Joe, the one that played bass, he wrote a song called Sometimes She Will and Sometimes She Won't. I recorded that with John Lee Hooker on San Francisco album. And um, one behind that, I played with the Grooves Home, I played with a lot of organ players around Michigan. I even did one little thing with Bob, Bob Crosser, Bill, uh, Ben Crosser's brother. Uh, Bob Crosser had a band too, he came to Detroit and I worked with him too. I worked with Larry Leaf Orchestra, that was a big uh, concert band. It did. Then I went to the Army and I stayed in the Army two years and I was in the Army band for two years. Came out of that, doing classical music, marches and all of those things. But uh, 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 I've just been, I've been kind of blessed for it. I thank God for all the blessings He has stored up on me. God has been extremely good to me. And I, I appreciate it, and I, I thank him for it. And the, but my, my greatest joy, really, my greatest joy is to entertain people. I love these people. I love people. People, see, they energize me. I'm going to be 80 or 40 years, and, and it wasn't for the people energizing me all these years. I think I'd have been a sick man. <laughs> <laughs> you think your career would have been, oh, how would it have been different if you hadn't moved to Detroit? If you I would stayed. have been different. Yeah. Uh, if I wouldn't have gone to Detroit, let me think how I would, I would have wound up. I would probably wind up playing in the church. See, I did a lot of things in the churches my, with my niece. And I loved to play in the church. I wrote a, I wrote a jazz mass uh, to St. Francis de Sales. In other words, uh, the same thing we do, the priest celebrate on the altar for everything that he he celebrate the music that go for that. I re revived it and, and made it in the jazz form, like for instance, uh, the Lamb of God. The, 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 the Lamb of God, Lamb of God, who takes away the sin of the Lamb of God, who takes away the sins of the world. I put a melody to that, the Lord's Prayer, you know? And, uh, 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 Lord have mercy, Lord have mercy, Lord have mercy, have mercy on me. Uh, amen, 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 amen. I wrote all of that out for, for the for the commission. And if it's so, I imagine if I wasn't in Detroit, I would wind up playing in the churches because uh, I get great rewards for that. I feel comfortable in there. And it doesn't take away nothing from my from my playing as far as playing jazz, because I I knew God is a happy God. He ain't no sad God. So I enjoy, I, that, that's what I would probably be doing. <laughs> how did you move back to New Orleans? You moved back to play for the hall? Or how did I come back to play for the hall? Yeah, well how did you decide to move back to New Orleans? Well, first of all, I already knew. Uh, that I was gonna come back home. That I already had in the back of my mind. I figured when I get tired of doing what I was doing in, in, in Michigan and New York and all of the other places, I was gonna close my eyes on my turf here in New Orleans. I made, that, made it up in my mind many years ago. Now what happened, Katrina came up, and I'm sitting in Detroit, and I looked on the TV and oh boy, mm. Looking at looking at the they're just washing us away. I was crying like a baby. I just couldn't take it. And uh, I knew that I had to make a move. There was nobody here in, in New Orleans to continue the music and then my father and my great grandfather, all my uncles and everything up. My dad had made the transition, my uncles had made their transition and everybody. And I was about the last of those that can continue playing this music. And I knew I had to go back to New Orleans. I knew I had to come back to New Orleans. So uh, uh, the business representative at that time uh, was, was uh, working here in New Orleans with, with the preservation band, called me, I was in Las Vegas at that time, asking would I be interested in doing a few dates with, with the preservation band. I said, yeah. I would, yeah, I'd like to do that. So he called me to do a few dates, and I came back right after Katrina. 
when they were trying to get musicians to come in here, they had nobody. So I joined the band, mm -hmm. and uh, so, when, so when I joined the band, they said, man, do you want this job? <laughs> I said, yeah. So I've been home ever since, and I, I was, at the, I think I was 77 years old. So that's it was about time for me to come back home, mm -hmm. but Katrina made it that much sooner, you know. So I came back at, at the age of 77. And so I'll be 84. So it's been, it been good to me. And, it, it, and this is about the greatest move I made in my life. Because uh, I'm doing what I want to do. I'm at home. I'm playing the music I want to play. And I feel comfortable uh, doing the type of thing that we are doing in order to preserve this music, to hand it down to the younger generation. Yeah. And uh, that's, that's what I want to do. I would like to keep this music alive for the next generation that's coming up. See, because these numbers are getting very, 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 very big. <laughs> but it's not too many young. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so I ain't mad about it now, get me wrong. <laughs> mm -hmm. wow. yeah. Well, we're glad you came back. Thank you. Mm -hmm.